the first thing I want to talk about is context. How has the context for public spending changed? Because I think that is that we don't think about that enough when we think about public spending. And one, so th this is for the UK. This is real GDP in the UK from 1948 to the middle of the last decade. And you can see that it's gone up by a multiple of five. Now the population has also gone up a little bit. So real GDP per head has gone up by between a multiple of four and five and has continued to do so. And I think we must have in our minds, and this is roughly true in most countries of the OECD, that we have seen extraordinary increases in the average level of uh, national income over that period. And of course, that's reflected in uh, very substantial growth in household wealth. So this is again for the UK, the ratio of aggregate household wealth to gross domestic income. And you can see that since the mid 1970s, this has gone from household wealth being three times the level of national GDI to nearly eight times the level of, level of national GDI. And that doesn't mean necessarily that we should have less public spending or more public spending, but these changes surely mean we should be looking at the composition of public spending and the way in which we do it. Life expectancy at birth. This is male and female, male in blue, female in green, life expectancy at birth in the UK. In 1942, it was 60 for men, and now it's 80. Uh, in 1942, it was uh, a bit more than 66 for women, and now it's, it's 87. Uh, let's put modal age at death on those as well. We haven't got time to think about the interesting way in which modal age at death for men stalled so badly in the 1970s and 80s, it was smoking um, and has subsequently caught up. Modal age at death for men, in 1942 was about 77 and is now about 89. Modal age of death for women was 82. It's now above 90 in the UK. These are massive changes and they're changes in some of the areas where we have public spending need, but of course there are also changes in areas where we could have public revenue capacity. The distribution of income. Uh, in the UK, this is the distribution of income for retired people in 1977, and you can see that in 1977, uh, this was the first year of data that I ever worked on when I started working, um, essentially old age and low income were highly, highly correlated. Um, so £10,000, €11,500 Euros a year, all in real terms nearly 80% of the retired population lived on incomes less than that. By 2016, the income distribution for retired people in the UK is completely changed. So we have principally, but not entirely as a result of policies introduced in the Blair Brown Labour government, made a massive dent in extreme pensioner poverty. So we have very few pensioners now living on anything like as low incomes as we did for most of the post-war period. But at least importantly, as we think about public spending, the distribution has widened massively. So from being highly focused on low incomes, we now have a pensioner income distribution that looks remarkably like the income distribution of those of working age. And, and surely that must have some consequence. This is just a, a chart that puts those two charts together. And you can see there has been an astonishing transformation. And this is also seen in many countries of the OECD. So uh, the reason I start with that is I think it's, it's often possible to think about public spending without thinking about the wider social and economic context. And the truth of, is that our social and economic context has been transformed over the last 70 years. And so we ought to be adjusting to that. Of course, there are sectors of the economy where we adjust very easily. And in our own private consumption decisions, it's very easy for us to adjust to the, to the changing context. We just change what we decide to do. So if, for example, we look at uh, this for the UK is the uh, share of total household consumption that was allocated to food. So back in the, it starts in 1964, back in the early 1960s, about 17% of household final consumption expenditure was on food. As incomes have radically increased over the subsequent period, there's been a steady decline in the share of our expenditure that goes on food. That's, that's been easily achieved and it's been the result of billions of individual people making individual decisions. Uh, we've 
radically reduced the share of our expenditure that goes on food and drink. And at the same time, we've radically increased the proportion of our expenditure that goes on transport, another largely privately consumed, privately funded good, uh, which in 1964 absorbed only about three and a half percent of household final consumption expenditure and, and, and got close to 14 percent in the early part of the last decade. We think these kinds of really radical shifts in the, in the composition of private expenditure are perfectly straightforward everyday occurrences. Uh, we'd see a similar pattern if, for example, we looked at leisure and recreation, which in, in uh, for those of us of my generation, when we were young, was a very, very small share of our total expenditure, is now a, a large and growing share of expenditure. So, so within private consumption, it's very easy to change the composition in the mix in response to changing contexts. What's happened in the public sector? Well, here, I think it is much, much more difficult to change composition. There are some long run, apparently inexorable trends that we see, uh, but, but significant structural adjustments, I'd argue, are quite difficult. If we look in the UK at the areas where most of the growth has taken place, they're in the areas that we tend to call the welfare state, so social security uh, transfer programs, health, education. As a share of total public expenditure, you, you can see that since immediately after the foundation of the post-war British welfare state, when these accounted for about a quarter of total spending, they're now up close to two thirds. If we look at that as a share of GDP rather than as a share of total public spending, you see the same trend. Welfare state expenditures, and this is true across the OECD as a whole, have, have increased very, very substantially indeed as a share of of uh, the economy from about one tenth to about one quarter in the case of the UK and continuing to rise. Now, of course, it, it's true that some, some elements of public spending have fallen during this period because taxes, the tax share has not risen from, by anything like this 15 percentage points of GDP. In the UK, and this again is true across most of the OECD, much the largest reduction has been in defence which for the UK was close to 10% of GDP in the immediate post-war period and is now down to 2%. That's the biggest single item that we've been able to cut as the pressures to increase spending in other areas have grown. We've run out of rope on that and the other areas where spending was readily cut. Infrastructure has been one of them. It, it seems to me, and we can talk about this more, and you will have talked about it in your individual countries and across the OECD, the pressures for a, a continued increase in spending in these areas, transfer payments, health, education, are unbelievably strong, not least because of the other changes in context which are continuing, which I described earlier, our, our incomes continue to rise. These are all areas where we would expect the income elasticity of demand to be greater than one. But perhaps most importantly, demography is, is it simply is going to lead to a substantial increase in demand in these areas. And, and we therefore have to have a sensible debate about what to do next. In the UK, for example, uh, over the next 20 years, the demand for healthcare, all else held constant, will increase by 50% simply as a result of demographic change that we are 99.9% .9 certain will happen. Uh, that means that the debate that we endlessly have in the UK, and I suspect you have similar debates elsewhere in the OECD about whether we need to increase the funding of the health service or reform it to make it more efficient, completely miss the point. The answer is we have no choice but to do both. We are absolutely going to spend more on health as an economy. There is no doubt about that. The only question is about whether we do that through public means or through private means. And uh, so the debate that we often hear around the world about whether we can afford to spend more on, on healthcare, for example, seems to me a completely facile debate. Uh, of course, we can afford to. We are, in the UK, we're four times as well off as we were in 1940. Th the question is, is simply, how are we going to do that? Are we going to do that together or as individuals and and we're not honest enough 
about those questions. Uh, and it's not just in health that the demographic change means that we will necessarily spend more. It's in transfer payments to older people as well. So these two, often the largest two items in, in the public budget, we will spend more in these areas. The big question is how we spend that more, whether we spend it as individuals or whether we spend it together. And, and that means I think that we have to have a more sensible and open debate about how we pay for these things that we want to consume and who pays. Uh, and that needs to include, for example, thinking much more about taxable, the taxable capacity of those over retirement age, which when most of our welfare states was created was very, very low and is now much larger and continuing to grow. And I also think it means we need to focus on consumption, what it is that we want to consume, not on expenditure. And in all of this, I think we have to recognize that our political systems do not work well in this space. And that when we look at decisions that have been made about public spending, there are some things that are very surprising and reflect results of political processes that have not been probably, I think, desired by anybody and have in many cases not been noticed. Let me show you one example of a surprising thing from the UK. So here is a chart that shows public spending as a share of GDP on the top line social security transfer payments, uh, most of which, uh, the, the bulk of which is to older people, although there are elements of working age and children in particular in there as well. That's the blue line, the red line education as a share of national income and the green line health as a share of national income. So you can see that in 1975-6, which is where those lines stop, uh, transfer payments are about 8% of GDP, health uh, was about 4.5% of GDP and education was about 6% of GDP. Let's strip it, we'll, we'll leave social security out and then let me show you what happened to health and education over the following 40 years or so. So health continued to grow and has continued to grow since, since this chart finished. Actually, it's now probably near a 9% and 8% of GDP. Uh, but something really very funny has happened, which is that the proportion of GDP spent on education uh, in the public sector in the UK has fallen from 6%. It's now actually down, uh, late, later stage, it's down to about 4.2%. So we actually reduced the share of, of GDP that's allocated to education by a third over a period when uh, real national income increased by a multiple of three. Now it's hard to think of a, of a commodity that is more certain to have an income elasticity of demand greater than one than education. And yet as a result of our political and budgetary processes in the UK, we've managed to reduce the share of, uh, of national economy and indeed the share of total public spending that goes to education. I think this points to many of the problems that occur in budgetary negotiations, which are almost always short term and highly politicized. And the areas of public spending that uh, grow most effectively are those where it's easiest to make a strong in the moment political argument. I don't want to suggest that any of this is easy. I, I feel as though I've been saying these sorts of things for 40 years. The, 40 years of my professional life while I've been working in this area. And I think many of us have been making these arguments, but I do think we need to think now and articulate more clearly some of the distinctions that are there. Uh, it's important to recognize that most public spending is not on public goods. And indeed on, on, on the genuinely public goods, there can be a bit less pressure on spending. The public provision of private goods is what most public spending is, and that has grown massively. And it's grown massively during a period when incomes have grown massively, as when private incomes have grown massively as well. There's no doubt in my mind that the share of our economies that will be dedicated to consumption in these areas will continue to rise. And I think the big choices that we face are about which parts of them we want to fund together and which individually. There are huge complications in shifting towards greater private, privately funded consumption in some of these areas. It's already happening and we have to be 
honest about that and try to work out in which areas we care most of all. Oh, amor, the choices, I think, are about... I think we have somebody who's probably not muted who would like to be. The choices, I think, are about who pays, not about ultimately what share of our economy is absorbed by these areas. But those choices are important and they require us to be much, much more honest and also much more clear than we have been, I think, in most debate in the last 30 or 40 years about why we want to do things together and which things we should do together. And in particular, if we accept, as is widely accepted by governments across the OECD, that there is a fairly hard limit to the proportion of the economy that can be absorbed by taxation, and therefore the proportion of consumption that can be funded jointly, then we're going to have to make some very, very difficult choices about no longer doing some things that have less high priority for communal consumption so that we can continue to do the things that we care about most. As far as I can see, there is no honesty in that political debate whatsoever. And at that point, I should stop.